prevalence of overweight and obese students in Tennessee dropped from 40.9% to 39% in the 2008-2009 school year. From 2005 to 2010, Tennessee's infant mortality rate dropped from 8.8 .8 to 7.9 infant deaths per 1,000 live births. In other words, 92 fewer babies died in 2010 compared to 2005. Tennessee's teen pregnancy rate has steadily declined over the past 15 years. By 2009, 532 fewer girls got pregnant than in 1998. What does Tennessee need to do to keep improving our children's health? Major funding for NPT Reports Children's Health Crisis is provided by the Healthways Foundation, addressing the critical issues of children's health and public education. The Monroe Carroll Jr. Children's Hospital at Vanderbilt. The Nashville Healthcare Council. Baptist Healing Trust, fostering access to compassionate health care in Middle Tennessee. Additional support provided by the Orrin H. Ingram Fund and by members of NPT. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kimberly Williams Paisley. From infant mortality to obesity to sexually transmitted infections, our community has historically ranked among the least healthy for children. But in the most recent statistics, we've begun to see an encouraging change. The numbers have started moving in the right direction. But what does it take for a community to go from being among the least healthy for children to among the healthiest? In this episode of NPT Reports Children's Health Crisis, we'll look at the changes that need to be made and the role that individuals, families, and whole communities play in ensuring that all of our children can lead healthy lives. Stay tuned. In 2009, Nashville hosted a first birthday party for babies who defied the city's poor infant mortality statistics. At the event, Mayor Carl Dean declared that Nashville would become the healthiest place in Tennessee for all infants to be born. This lofty goal reflects a growing understanding in the city and across the state of the important role children's health plays in Tennessee's future. But with Tennessee's current standing in national health rankings, achieving that goal will be hard won. When people have a baby, they always want their baby to be the best, and they always want to hope for the most. Um, with where we've been in many health rankings, just to be average would be a, a much improvement, but, but that's not enough. In fact, if Tennessee were average in state rankings on infant mortality, 128 fewer babies would die per year. If Tennessee reached the highest rank, 359 fewer babies would die. If Tennessee lowers the teen birth rate for girls ages 15 to 19 to reach average rankings, more than 2,400 fewer babies would be born to teens. To achieve the highest rank, more than 7,100 fewer babies would be born each year. When looking at the number of children in poverty, a factor that is tied closely to health, Tennessee would need to have 58,000 fewer children living in poverty to reach national averages. To reach the highest rank, 232,000 children would have to be lifted out of poverty. If we don't improve our trajectory for children's health as a state, we are not being stewards of our most precious resource. If we don't provide that stewardship, we won't see the kind of activity that we want to see in our state. It won't be a place of as much joy as we'd like it to be. The economy won't be where we need it to be. The health in a community is going to make a big difference on where business wants to operate. The health in the community determines workforce, it determines productivity, it determines quality of life. All of those things are very important to businesses. Whether they're already here or they're moving here, they want to come to a healthy community because it's a productive community. 
we need to continue to strive so all children in Nashville and in Tennessee have the opportunity to be healthy, to be safe, because they are the future of this state and of this community. They are the economic engine of the future for Tennessee, and what we do for them now really helps with a more prosperous Tennessee in the future. Tennessee is a leader in so many ways, but it really has its work cut out for it to become a leader in the health of its citizens. To make real changes, we're gonna to have to do things in our own homes. The refrigerator should not be filled with soft drinks and cake. It ought to have abundant fruits and vegetables. It ought to have healthy food for our kids to be eating. That's just a start in the home. At a larger level, in the community that we're living in, if you want to buy a carton of milk, you should not have to get in the car. You ought to be able to walk to meet a lot of your life needs. If you want to get to a more distant place, we're going to need transit systems, light rail, other ways to get back and forth to where we're going. So changing the home, changing the neighborhood environments, changing the school environments, this is not gonna happen overnight. Really the first most crucial element of change is recognizing that you have a problem. Whether you're an individual or you're a state, are we at a tipping point? I think we're very close. One of the things we're trying to do is to get everybody pulling in that same direction so we can finally get over to the side that recognizes this is a significant societal issue and, and if we're not a part of the solution, we're a part of the problem. Acknowledging the problem is only the first step in improving community health. Convincing people to change unhealthy habits into healthy ones is a much more complex step. Jack, put yours in there. When we want to change an individual's behavior, there are several different spheres of influence that impact people's decision making. So not only is there the individual, but you have to think about their families and the groups that they work with, their friend systems, their congregations and groups that they connect to, and then the culture that they live in. All of those things work together to change somebody's personal decision making. Come on, ladies. Wendy Smith decided she needed to change her family's health after her daughter was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Olivia was only 13 years old. She was a borderline level, so it, it wasn't that bad. I was surprised, but I wasn't because it's, it's in our family. Um, but, you know, we, we just took it head on. We were, we were like, okay, we're going to fight this. We have changed our eating. You know, it's a lifestyle change with your eating. So she changed her eating, she started exercising, she takes her medicine. We go to the appointments like we're supposed to. Gabby and I have chose to do the same thing with her, to do it as a family, so that we can all do this together and encourage one another and lift each other up. The family's commitment to improving Olivia's health has paid off. Her blood sugar levels are now back in the normal range. I still have to take my metformin medication, but now I don't have to check my sugar as much. I only have to check it once a day. I've lost weight. I can do more things. I can, it's just a total transformation just within a year or two. And I have a lot more confidence and not only with looking better, but feeling better. Is that too heavy? Olivia's sister, Gabby, has also benefited from the lifestyle changes, losing 50 pounds in the past two years. She plays soccer, so she's able to run more. She uh, can play more positions. She was junior varsity, she got to play in varsity. So she got a lot of playing time for this to be her first year of school ball. While the whole family has seen improvements in their health, the changes did not come easily. To be honest, the hardest part basically is getting up and doing it. I mean, People will say, you know, eating right or doing the right exercises, but it's actually getting up off the couch for 30 minutes a day. I always had this saying where even if you won run lap, you still outran people that were sitting on the couch, you know. So that, that kept me motivated. Some of the obstacles that I went through is not having a job, so money has been an issue. I guess transportation too, like trouble with my van, not having gas money. Thankfully, we've always lived somewhere where we could walk or been able to go to a park. This last year, not so much because of the driving issues and the gas and things like that, but we could walk around. I mean, like Gabby and I went out and played basketball. They had like a court over there. We would go out there and play basketball for fun. 
uh, walk around the apartment complex, which is not big, but it's still it's walking. You know, Olivia would do Zumba. I think Olivia's story is really compelling because it showed how, in addition to Olivia's family being able to be a really great support and Olivia making those individual choices, she was able to be in a community that also supported those choices. She has places that make it easier for be, her to be active and make it easier for her to try to make healthy decisions. So while individuals have responsibility to make changes in their own lives, the other side of that, you also have to make healthy decision making easy, have to change systems and policy and support community health on a larger scale. So from individuals, families, communities, organizations, up through policy and system change, all of those things need to work together. We need to create a culture of health. And that's within ourselves, whether we're walking or eating sensibly, within our families and in our neighborhoods. If we're surrounded by people who don't smoke, who eat sensibly, who go out for a walk or a jog during lunchtime, we're more likely to do it. And if we're surrounded by people who believe that comfort food is something loaded with sugar and fat and salt, we're likely to buy into that. So the culture shift is just as important as the personal shift. Most of us are not strong enough to do this all by ourselves. We need support systems, support systems in our family and in our community to make these changes. We really have to look at the whole range of, of systems in our neighborhoods and in our city. We have to look at things like housing, transportation, availability of food supplies, grocery stores, as well as the school system and how all those interact to provide opportunities for people to be successful. We include things like parks and recreation, the whole range of systems that really support a healthy and vibrant community also helps improve the health of the inhabitants of that community. But changing even just one of those systems can be a daunting task. Schools and school food systems in particular are an obvious place to look for ways to improve children's health. Many children rely on the federal meal programs as their main source of nutrition. A lot of children have at least one major meal, many have two major meals at school. So it's the place where they're getting most of their nutrition. Nutrition, we know, is strongly related to disease and health outcomes, so this for me is a no-brainer. School lunch is a place to reach most children um, across the country. It's a place where we can reach our most vulnerable children, those who are living in poverty, those from minority backgrounds who are both greater risk for poor nutrition and greater risk for kinds of disease outcomes better nutrition can prevent. Can I see this? Nashville chef and local food advocate Jeremy Barlow became interested in the food served in schools when his daughter entered kindergarten. Metro Nashville Schools serves more than 72,000 meals per day. Over 72% of the students qualify for free and reduced meals. My first impression of Metro School Food was, I think like most parents, um, scared. Maybe that's a little bit of harsh of a word, but just, you know, not pleased. You know, steam table vegetables and burgers and fries and, you know, we can put any spin on it we want. That is what was there. For the past five years, Barlow has been working with a parent group, advocating for numerous improvements to Metro Nashville school food. It's like turning a aircraft carrier in a lake, where it's almost impossible to do. We were really having some trouble making any inroads. Uh, you know, we were pretty much flat out told we meet and exceed all the USDA standards, which is true. So that's one thing that we have to keep in mind that these individuals are doing their job and they are actually are doing a really good job of it. Um, it's the standards that is some of the problem. Though the federal government improved standards in 2011, Jeremy Barlow's group pushed Metro to move towards more locally sourced food, more cooking from raw ingredients, removing flavored milk, and limiting the junk food available for purchase. When the parent group and school system reached an impasse, they turned to Alignment Nashville, a unique organization that brings together school employees, representatives from nonprofit organizations, as well as local businesses to create a plan to improve Metro Nashville schools. We formed a food committee meeting under Alignment Nashville, which gave us strength throughout the community to just to promote and, and, and do a lot of good things for our students. We have 10 pilot schools now that we're going to start introducing new items in. It's more scratch cooking, 
more fresh fruits and vegetables, more salad bars or inline salad bars and staff training. What we want to do is thoroughly introduce them and get things right in those 10 pilot schools. And then we will expand uh, throughout the rest of the 140 Nashville schools, which we feel we can do within a three to five year period. For a restaurant owner accustomed to having his decisions enacted immediately, Jeremy Barlow has found the pace of change frustrating. When something needs to happen, you, you fix it. You know, quick change fix. So getting used to the politics of fixing things, which, I mean, it's a giant corporation, everything's legal, every, you know, for something that you would think is as easy as growing lettuce in a garden outside the window at school, or bringing it in and putting it on the lunchroom counter is, and I think it took the school garden people a year to be able to get, to go through Metro Legal to be able to make that transition. Three hours west of Nashville, Anthony Geraci oversees a massive central kitchen and the entire food service system for Memphis City Schools. In just six months on the job, Geraci has made significant changes to the program. The major changes that we've made are just uh, the commitment to local, fresh, cook from scratch delivery. Um, so we source a lot of our food from the surrounding area. We cook that food from scratch uh, and we make sure that our kids have access to fresh fruits and vegetables on a daily basis. We have launched the largest demonstration school garden project in, in the state's history where actually the food that's being grown out there will be served in their cafeterias in just a few weeks. Geraci has also instituted a profitable recycling program, canceled contracts for foods like Pop-Tarts, and eliminated flavored milk from the breakfast and supper programs. Next year, flavored milk will only be offered once or twice a week during lunch. And it takes a while to make those types of systemic change. Um, and it can be difficult sometimes, but for every problem, there's three or four solutions, you know, but you just need to be willing to exercise that. You know, people are really quick to say, well, that's the way it's always been. That's how we do this. Well, if it's not working, then that's not how you do it. You have to do it a different way. Memphis City Schools serves more than 100,000 meals a day. While the size of the operation provides economies of scale, it took more than sheer numbers to move the system towards fresh, made from scratch, and locally sourced food. It begins with visionary leadership, all right? I'm able to do the things that I do because I have visionaries above me. They understand that child nutrition is readiness, you know? It is one of the tools for success in public education. So one of the mandates that they gave me was, make this happen. This is the hardest part of leadership, is leading, you know? You can't wait for somebody else to do it. You have to do it. You're asking about how we change the system and how we change that system across multiple systems and across multiple institutions, where a healthy choice is the default choice or the easy choice. That really does, again, begin with the admission uh, that we have a problem, and it's going to take a concerted societal, cultural, and governmental effort to uh, make a change. That really requires political will. In many ways, Tennessee has shown leadership and political will in addressing the health of its children by implementing public health programs that have paid off in improving statistics. We've done this through a variety of strategies that include things like increasing prenatal care and home visitation programs for expectant mothers, improving access to prevention and treatment through the state children's health insurance program, as well as quality pre-K programs, early childhood programs, and coordinated school health in Tennessee public schools have all made a difference. So if we've got 10, you're eating double, aren't you? So we've made some efforts that are incredibly important. We don't always have the resources that are needed to make them be um, implemented as broadly as would be desirable for the entire population. When I was a young doctor, we were spending 7% of all the money in the United States on medical care. We're now spending 19% of all the money on medical care. And medical care is not health care. We need to be spending the first dollar on prevention 
because if we wait till the medical system gets done spending all the money they need to spend on what they want to do, there's nothing left for the prevention program. She is going to see the pulmonologist, Dr. Moore, he knows about it. Understandably, political leaders have to focus on a one to two year horizon. They're under a lot of pressure, and we got to make sure the pressure they're under is a pressure for health, a pressure for our kids, a pressure for a vision for a place that is healthy for all of us, not simply a short-term return on investment, because sooner or later, we're going to pay for this. We're going to pay for it with higher rates of diabetes, higher rates of obesity, higher rates of school failure, higher rates of heart disease as we get older and the rest, or we pay for it in the short term, and it's much cheaper to prevent than it is to cure. In 2006, Tennessee became the first state in the nation to mandate coordinated school health, a model developed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to address the physical, mental, and emotional health of students. The program relies on a coordinator in each school district to harness the resources of public and private organizations to meet that district's needs. Whether it's a school-based health clinic, school gardens, or learning how to integrate physical activity into everyday language arts lessons. The coordinated school health model is sustainable if we've got the funding in place. And again, you know, we get $15 million every year and that averages out about $16 per child, which is not a lot of money when you look at it that way, but it's that funding that pays for that coordinator in each school district and that's what's invaluable. Coordinated school health has shown initial success in reducing obesity rates among students. Despite this, state funding to pay for the district coordinators has not been secure for the past several years. Okay, and those of you who have an 11 o'clock with Henry, we're going to get this done quick so you can head straight there. On a windy March day, members of the Tennessee Obesity Task Force converged on the state capitol to urge lawmakers to make health and coordinated school health, a priority in the state's 2013 budget. Most important thing is we want to um, ask you to support Governor uh, Haslam's budget insofar as keeping the coordinated school health 15 million recurring funds in that budget. Yeah, well, we've always fought for that. Yes. Change in our society, honestly, needs to come from the top and from the bottom. It needs to come from the top in the sense of leaders of the health of the nursing, of the education, and eventually the political establishment need to have a big vision of a healthy place for our children, a healthy place for our society. And Tennessee needs to have that vision. But it also needs to come up from the community. You have to get together and say, yes, we have 20 goals to make that we want to have happen, but here's number one. Because if you go to the political leader and, and everyone goes there and says, this is what we want, the political leader will do it. Because if the people leave, the politicians will eventually follow. By the time these babies, born in 2010 at a Nashville hospital, are old enough to have children, the city of their birth may look quite different. Nashville is projected to grow by close to a million people over the next 20 years or so. And uh, anyone who lives in the city understands that a million more people here, a million more cars is going to, if we continue to do things the way that they are now, is going to equal a lot of congestion, a lot more air pollution, crowding, and just, I think, can be a lot of negative things. If Nashville is to fulfill its pledge of becoming the healthiest place for children to be born, it will have to not only address the current health issues, it will also have to plan carefully for the impact of this much larger population. Staff at the Nashville Civic Design Center have been working on a plan to help guide future decisions around infrastructure and development. Shaping the Healthy City Project is focused on using Nashville as a case study city across the United States of how we can address public health issues uh, in context of the built environment and how we as a city can start to design our city that hopefully has a positive public health outcomes. The plan addresses six areas that affect people's health, transportation, open space and parks, housing, food resources, walkability, and neighborhood design and development. All of these systems, I think, are about how you connect them all together more. I like to make the example of the historic pikes that we have in Nashville and how 
historically those all converged in downtown, but if you look at Nashville, it's really like the spoke of a wheel, and you have all these historic pikes radiating out of downtown. Well, most of those pikes are the idea of that single-use zoning. They're all commercial strips that have a lot of aging infrastructure on them. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity for redeveloping our historic pikes into those really vibrant, mixed-use avenues and boulevards that we've all seen in cities like Paris. You know, they have really active cafes and, and shops and with people living above them. Putting the public transportation in so that they're not congested, that people can use buses and light rail someday, uh, commuter rail that can connect to our local communities as well will be a component of that. So that you can see how we can grow in the city because there's areas like that to grow in. And we can also maintain the great neighborhoods that we have that are kind of between these pikes. This is America. People ought to have choices. But what we've done too often is eliminate choice for people. In Atlanta, there was no choice about whether you drive to get to work. It was the only way you're going to get to work. So some of the stuff that has to change doesn't sound very exciting. You have to change the fundamental general plan or the master plan, the constitution for growth in an area. You have to create zoning that encourages live, work, play. This is happening. In fact, it's happening because guess where the homes are holding their value best in the United States? It's places in walkable communities. Over 60% of the American population who are out trying to buy a home right now want to be in a community that's walkable. Things are beginning to change. In fact, in 2011, Tennessee moved out of the bottom 10 states on the national ranking of overall child health. But we will have to make significant changes to continue to move up the rankings. In fact, if Tennessee were average in state rankings on low birth weight babies, 819 fewer babies would be born too small. If Tennessee reached the highest rank, more than 2,700 babies would be born at a healthy weight. When looking at the number of children living in families where no parent has full-time employment, another factor closely linked to health, more than 59,000 children's parents would need to be employed to achieve average rankings. To reach the highest ranking, more than 224,000 children's parents would need to find work. I think to truly have a culture of health, we have to have a recognition on the part of individuals, on the part of business and the faith community, on the part of government, that we all have a role to work together to provide the kinds of opportunities for children and for adults to be healthy. is it really does take all of us working together to make our children healthier because that, that's our future. That's the future of the state of Tennessee. And if we don't do it, who's going to do it? And if we don't do it now, then when? talk about the current health of our children, we're also talking about the future health and prosperity of our entire community. From the babies who struggle to live past their first birthday, to the adolescent who faces a lifetime of serious illness due to obesity, sexually transmitted infections, or mental health problems, their futures depend on what we decide to do today. While we've started to move our statistics in the right direction, we need to continue the conversation about what we want our future to be and what role health plays in that future. And that conversation needs to happen on the individual and family level, as well as community and state levels. What do we need to do to ensure our children's health? Please join me in learning more about the children's health crisis in Tennessee and what you can do about it by tuning in to NPT's ongoing coverage and by going to wnpt.org slash children's health.
Major funding for NPT Reports Children's Health Crisis has been provided by the Healthways Foundation, addressing the critical issues of children's health and public education. The Monroe Carroll Jr. Children's Hospital at Vanderbilt. The Nashville Healthcare Council. Baptist Healing Trust, fostering access to compassionate health care in Middle Tennessee. Additional support provided by the Orrin H. Ingram Fund and by members of NPT. Thank you.